Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. Happy to be here. Happy that everybody's joining us. Grateful for Mr. Silva to be here steering this ship. And yeah, no, I'm having a great day. Looking forward to uh, hanging out with Mrs. B this afternoon. I think we're going to see a movie this evening. And yeah, that's my life, man. Well, I'm loving it and I'm loving all that's going on in wrestling. We're going to break it down the good, the bad, and the ugly. But before we do, I want to give you a heads up as you're listening to this sting has already had his last match and we broke it down. We did a pre-show. We did a post-show. We have exhausted every detail of sting's last match in the entire AEW revolution pay-per-view. And you can get both the pre-show and the post-show fallout, the reaction, the interactive comments right now at 83weeks.com. That'll take you directly to our YouTube. We were live for the pre-show and the post-show and taking live questions. And if you missed it, you can still enjoy it right now. All of our archives are available at 83weeks.com. That's our YouTube. It's totally free. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications bell so you'll know the next time we're going live. And I don't mind sharing that we do plan to go live as we get closer to WrestleMania. We've got a big go home raw coming up. We've got a big go home SmackDown coming up. And of course, not one, but two nights of WrestleMania 83 weeks.com and our YouTube will be the place to be to get Eric's take and interact live Man, live. YouTube is a whole new ball game for us. And I had a blast with it, Eric. What about you? I mean, everything's better live, right? It's one of the reasons why when, when I had that gun to my head and Ted Turner said, Oh, go compete. The first thing I knew I had to do was be live. And that was before anybody else was live every week <clears throat> in wrestling. And I, there's just something magic about live. As much as I love doing this show, I look forward to it every week, you know, sitting down with you and Dave Silva and, and having some fun here in 83 weeks. But doing it live is just different. And then, of course, you get the interaction from you know, people joining us in with their comments and their questions and I just, I, I so much enjoy doing it. I'm glad we're making this uh, a priority. 2024 YouTube live 83 weeks.com. If you're not doing it, oh my God, know what you're missing. Let's talk a little bit about uh, something that I saw on my timeline this week. I, I was shocked. You know, you and I talked about it even just last week, the popularity of the NWO t-shirt and the idea that all these years later, I mean, goodness gracious, nearly 30 years later, it's still in the top 10 for current WWE merchandise sales, which is just wild to me, but I actually see this shirt out in the wild all the time, but I saw it this past week on my timeline and thought, let me see if Eric recognizes this photo. You recognize this NWO clad is that, Oh, is that Brad Siegel's niece? That is not Brad Siegel's niece. No, then I don't recognize her. Who is it? Uh, that is mattress actress, Sarah J. She is a, a legend to some of our listeners and viewers here on YouTube. She was not in fact, at sold out in Iowa, but, uh, she is an adult film star, Eric, a mattress actress. Still well, sporting I'm glad, the I, I'm, I'm glad, <clears throat> I'm glad I <laughs> said I didn't recognize her for crying out loud. Well, we wouldn't have blamed you if you did. Um, this has been an interesting week to say the least with Sting's last match, lots of reports out about the behind the scenes stuff going on in AEW. We talked on some of that on our, our live feed over the weekend, 83 weeks.com. But man, everybody and their brother is talking about the rock. It was an interesting week. I guess I think it was uh, Friday morning when the rock <clears throat> posted a 21 minute promo at first, I only saw like a six minute clip. So I thought it was a six minute clip and then it kind of got cut off at the end. And I wondered, Hey, what was cut off? So I found the full thing. I think this was filmed outside of his house. You can see like his uh, makeshift gym there in Hawaii, uh, but it's all tinted there. And I guess that's his iron paradise or whatever he calls it. But man, he was in full blown classic rock mode. And if the legend is true back in the day, 
Rock was always under the impression, hey, you can't go too long. It's live. So occasionally, maybe he'd go long on TV. And occasionally, maybe that would create some chaos backstage. <laughs> occasionally. But the, <laughs> but the great thing on uh, social media is, well, you can take as much time as you want. I don't remember seeing a 21 minute promo before uh, on social media, but he's the rock and he made it happen. And maybe, you know, it could have been tightened up a little bit if it was for TV. But my takeaway was this is getting good. What'd you think? So many things. I was thinking so many different things almost all at the same time. I actually watched the promo back again. So I spent 42 minutes and change looking at that promo. And first of all, it was so, so much different than anything else we've seen. Yes. Which, you know how I feel about that. That's how you break new ground. You try things that are typically not done. Sometimes they're radical, sometimes not so much. But to, for rock, especially, given the magnitude of his stardom, to use social media in a way to really advance the story, but do it so much differently than he's either able to do on television or willing to do on television. I just, it, it you know, the language that he used, it was a little, you know, it had no problem swearing social media. I, I don't know how I feel about that exactly, but it did reinforce the fact that this is different than yes. this is a side of rock. You're not going to see when you tune into Fox, right? This is a side of rock that feels more personal, therefore creating some emotion, right? So whether you, I, I like it or dislike it really doesn't matter. It was effective. Um, the way they used the uh, Dave LaGreca stuff. Yes. That was different than. Yes. So different. Than, and by the way, hats off to Dave and, and Bully and Company. That was a huge shout out for them and, and really good for the business. <clears throat> but the way that was utilized and kind of brought into the story, it was part of the larger context of that 21 minute, you know, where Rock is out there addressing the naysayers and using it. To his advantage, that's some rock jujitsu going on there. Promo jujitsu. I love that. You're using the audience and their reaction to you, and you're bringing them into the story, acknowledging them, and then turning it around on them like a good heel should. I just, it was so good. And it, it told such an amazing story, and it made me far more interested than I was already. And I was already interested. This is really. We could, we could probably spend two hours talking about this and, and, and everything else that's gone up, gone on up until this point. <clears throat> but to, I'll just give you my, my take on it since you didn't ask. Well, you did kind of, that's what started this. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I still believe that rock came in with the plan crowd reacted to that plan that we, that created the necessity to kind of, all right, here's where we're at. Let's make some sense out of this. Let's make the most sense out of this. Let's make it better than it already was. If we can. And the way they used all the clips from everything that's happened backstage stuff at the press conference and all that, and then told us what some of that communication was between the two, when we couldn't actually hear the dialogue there, <clears throat> they're creating a cohesive story based on something that was unplanned. Yes. I find that process and the thinking behind it so interesting because that's how I watch this stuff. I don't watch it. To see who, who wins who the match. Four star yeah. match and does it. That's not my deal. My deal is how are they presenting the product? How are they presenting the story? How are they engaging the audience? And is it working? And obviously we saw what happened Friday night after this video hit social media. It was like a continuation in a way. So there was some great continuity there. Now, it was just so, so, so good. We'll talk about SmackDown, I'm sure. But <clears throat> as far as that promo goes, I think that broke new ground. 
the last time I looked, it was last night when I looked at it, it had like 3.8 million views, which by the way is probably double what they'd get on Raw and another 40% more than they'd get on SmackDown. It's way more than that when you can figure or you count all of the aggregate stuff too. You know, like you saw I mean, just that one feed, but by the time everybody else has copied and posted it, I mean, it could be, it could be 15, 20 million by now. It's just such a fascinating evolution. Just one little, another little step into the future. Right. And, and I've, I brought up before, one of the reasons that I became a fan of Becky Lynch back in 2019, before I even, you know, went, went to work for WWE for that brief stint. I became a, a fan of Becky Lynch, not because I discovered her on television, but because I discovered her on social media. And she stood out to me because to me, she was like, wow, this, this young lady is actually using social media to shape and advance her character as opposed to, you know, what most people use social media for. She's, she's using it like it's a tool for her, for her character, for her story. And as I'm following her and following her, I thought, okay, well, this is really getting interesting. I, I got to go. I made an appointment with myself to go check her out on, on television because I wanted to see what this character was all about. And it's, that's when I really connected with her. my point in saying all this is this is another example in a, a massive one, again, given the rock is it's hopefully we're going to see talent really beginning to use social media in a much better way to advance their stories and care. This, I just thought it was cool as shit and it was so cool bringing reality into it, <clears throat> but in a way that allows you to create the fiction that you're building on. I just thought it was so cool. And that's not the first time anybody's ever done it. Well, I've done it. AEW's done it. WWE's done it. I mean, everybody's done it. Right. But to do it at this level and this effectively, as a means to kind of fill up a couple little that they're not gaping holes in the story and the setup to the story, but there's some, there, there was there's some dents there that needed to be addressed and they addressed it and they're doing it in social media and it brought the story together. Uh, yeah. Can you tell I'm excited just a little bit? I know you were excited when I saw you on Twitter and you said better than less than or different than the rock just nuked different than I totally agree. You know, it was, uh, we could beat it up and be critical and nitpick it, but it felt real and it was, uh, it felt organic and I loved that he little things in there where he made sure to mention all the big wigs at Netflix. He, he made sure to mention the real life circumstance of him and Ari Emanuel. I mean, he's leaning into, here's all the reasons you should hate me. And I have all the power. And he was pretty out front about the fact that he doesn't just own his name. He owns all of his old catchphrases and all of the rock quote unquote IP. I thought that was all really well done and finding a way to include Seth Rollins, but stopping just short of mentioning triple H. And we saw a little bit of that on Friday night, SmackDown as well. I think, uh, they're trying to add more and more depth and I think it's pretty plain to me to see where this is headed. Uh, and I'm for it. It's going to be an exciting time uh, to this road to WrestleMania. But before we talk about the, the SmackDown promo, one of the things that surprised me in a good way is when the rock looked right at the camera and said something along the lines of that 21 minute promo from his house in Hawaii. I believe Cody Rhodes, man to man from the bottom of my heart. Fuck your story. That was so, I mean, I was shocked. I was shocked for, for different reasons, but I can't go into all the reasons I was shocked. I just didn't think I would hear that out of rock given his stature in the industry. And continuing, still, the nature of the wrestling industry is still really sensitive when it comes to advertiser sponsors and that kind of thing. So even though it wasn't on television, um, to hear to hear that delivery, a it made it feel real and organic, yes. and it wasn't a contrived, you know, wrestling promo, which I've expounded on so often, frequently on this show for sure. 
how much I hate traditional wrestling promos and how dated they are. This brought that to 2024, this promo we're talking about. <clears throat> Could you do it on television? <clears throat> no. Sorry about that. Start using my mute button more often. I've actually read some notes where people saying, damn, clear your throat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you used to have the mute button down pat. And then a week or two ago, you did have more than normal. But I'm like, hey, man, he's on a roll. He's feeling it. I'm going to let it lay. Yeah, I've, and, I've, 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 and, and, and yeah, it's embarrassing. And the reason I just don't do it more often is because my, my mute button is so much further away. I don't want to lean into it. Anyway. I can talk on and on and on about that promo. Everything felt real. It felt organic. We were talking about the Sting Darby Allen promo you know, the week before. And, one of the, and it was a great promo. I'm not cutting it down. I'm not hating on it. But I pointed out simply that one of the ways that promo could have been made better was to make it feel more organic and not put it in front of a setting that looked like a setting. Now, a set. I was, was told later that that's actually Sting's front door or yes. Sting's house. Great. It still looked like a set because they lit it that way. Yes. Rock shooting that out in front of his gym or whatever it was, wherever it was. It made it look real. It made it look spontaneous. It made it look unproduced. And that's what I That's why it felt so organic. That among other things, his ability to deliver it and drop in some F-bombs in there and all that stuff made it feel real. And that's what this is about, right? Getting people engaged in your story by making it feel real. And contrast what we saw a lot of Darby Allen and, and, and Sting last week. Again, great promo. Delivery was excellent. The change in mood. Breaking character. Suck me in. I could put it over for a long time. The thing I can't quite put over is the setting in which it took place. If that same promo would have taken place in a setting, much like Rox did, a natural environment, which is a little tougher because these guys are wearing makeup, I get it, but it can still be achieved. That promo would have been on the same level or had the same level of enthusiasm that this promo does for me. Okay, It was close, but Rock promo, I hope, sets a trend. I hope they do it more often by new and creative ways to do it, all while making it organic. Otherwise, it's just like we see on TV and it won't be. Okay, I'm off that. Do you think um, I, for one, really like the idea, as silly as this is, of the rock cursing? I know that sounds dumb and it sounds simplistic, but one of the things I liked about ECW is the guys would just talk like real guys did. Like the idea that, you know, there was a storyline once where, you know, the Dudley boys broke Tommy Dreamer's girlfriend, Beulah McGillicuddy's neck with a 3D, the Dudley death drop through the table or whatever. And now she's in a neck brace and blah, blah, blah. If Tommy Dreamer's promo would have been Bubba Ray Dudley, I'm going to kick your butt. I am so upset with you. Man, that's not how real people talk. But The Rock in delivering. Man to man from the bottom of my heart, fuck your story was like, wow, that's the way people talk in real life. Like the real Dwayne Johnson and, 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 and that's the way people talk and it, it felt real. And I, we know it's wrestling. We know it's entertainment. We want to suspend our disbelief, but I'm, I'm curious since we're headed towards Netflix. And it's no longer going to be on broadcast television for Monday night raw. I know that SmackDown is still going to be on USA, but the old regime thought we need to be more advertiser friendly. We need to be more PG. I get all that, but it does feel like the rock can pretty much do what he wants. And I, for one and for the adult language. And then on SmackDown. There was a reference, and I think this might be the first reference in WWE TV where we say the words cocaine and meth. That was crazy. I just don't. These are things we've never seen before in WWE. F-bombs, references to cocaine and meth. And part of me is like, is this The Rock just doing whatever the hell he wants because he can? Or do you think the WWE is like, I'm not saying going full-blown attitude era. But if we're going to Netflix anyway, we can turn the volume up a little bit. What do you think? It sure looks that way, 
right? The, the interesting thing will be if that's the case, and, and I agree with you, it looks like that's going to happen. Really, um, I'm just being me, and this is the part of you know having spent time in the pressure cooker of being an executive. I'll be curious to see how that affects potential sponsorship and advertisers for SmackDown. Does it? Because buyer, media buyers aren't going to say, oh, well, that's raw on Netflix. Because their media buyers work for the company that's buying the advertising. Media buyers, what they, they're agents, right? So if you're a, a, a car company, you're going to go to your ad agency. And within that ad, ad agency, there is a media buying group. And that media buying group buys the best media that they can find most efficiently on a cost per thousand basis to the Deliver the impact that the advertiser is looking for against the audience that is the target audience. Okay, that's just basically how it works. But the people that are on the buying side that do the buying, these are not wrestling fans. These are not people that listen to wrestling podcasts, read dirt sheets, go online, find out what's going on. They have zero knowledge of, of the industry. Generally speaking, not 100% of the time, but generally speaking, if you put 100 of these people in a room because they're New York and L.A. based people, right? They're in the ad industry. They're Fifth Avenue kind of people, right? If you put 100 of them in a room and ask them to tell you the difference between Raw and SmackDown, couldn't do it. No. Most of them don't even know what Raw and SmackDown is. They're buying numbers all day. Professional wrestling as a whole. If you ask them about, you know, what what wrestling companies are in the professional wrestling business that currently have television shows, out of a hundred people, if five of them, ten of them could answer, I'd be surprised. Right. I'd be pleasantly surprised if ten of them answered. So when something negative is printed in Variety, if you will, or any of the publications that advertisers, media buyers, people within the industry, the business of the entertainment business, not wrestling fans, not 83 weeks listeners, right? Talking about people that are just in the business of the media business who aren't wrestling fans. When they hear something, see something adverse, negative about professional wrestling, whether it's AEW, WWE, SmackDown, Rock, Raw, it doesn't matter. It all has the same impact. It makes them, I just don't know if I want to pitch wrestling to my client. I don't want to go back to my client and say, hey, I've got a really good media buy. I want to, I want to, I want to place here, but I, I need to let you know because we're we're into programming that's, you know, it's different. It's really popular. People love it. The rock's there. But it is wrestling. Now, if that if that client doesn't necessarily love the wrestling business, it could be you could be you could be advocating for a product that you're your client is going to look at you cross-eyed for. And that's when I say, it's not that I don't like it. It's not, I mean, you've been around me long enough. I, I got a horrible foul mouth, especially when I'm having fun and getting excited, you know? Fuck yeah, you do. Yes, I do. But I wonder, and I'm a lo- little concerned that it'll have a negative impact on the ad buying community. Even though it's on Netflix, it's still wrestling. It's still WWE. It's still The Rock. And I'm just curious. That's all. I'm not saying it will or it won't, but I am very curious because historically that's been an issue in professional wrestling. I think they're going to get a pass because it's The Rock doing it. And I think if I was an advertiser and I had, I don't mean for this to sound dismissive of the pro wrestling biz. Clearly I'm a huge fan and a big supporter given all that I do in the space, but a nameless faceless, a guy that's not known to the mainstream, like a very talented young performer, I'm sure, but someone who doesn't necessarily have the name recognition and value of Dwayne Johnson. I think if Dwayne Johnson does it, it's a little different than if we just have every Tom, Dick and Harry on the show doing it. Cause if I'm an advertiser, who's not very familiar with wrestling and I see Joe Schmo but wrestler number a, I don't know who that is, but he's talking about cocaine and meth. I could see how maybe I would be nervous about that, but I think the headline anytime the rock is there is, Hey, your commercial is going to air during Dwayne Johnson's show. Oh, okay. 
And so now just because his name is associated to it, it feels like it's going to get a bigger pass. At least that's. It mitigates it. It, yes. it does soften it up <clears throat> just a little bit. You know, the other thing I was thinking about as you were talking and realizing too, is perhaps things have changed in the ad world, in the ad buying world, and even on the client side. Hold on. I'm reaching for my mood. You're all welcome. Is, by the way, is it moot or mute? It's, it's, mute. It, it's mute, but um, what I'd like to do is mute some of these unnecessary charges I see on my credit cards every month. And I have to admit, I thought I had that figured out until I found out about Rocket Money. That's right. Rocket Money is one of our advertisers here on the program, and we are delighted to tell you about their service because it really, really works. I just recently turned my parents onto this. I've been using Rocket Money for almost two years now. But I turned my parents on to this and I said, mom, dad, you got to try this. And my mom is pretty meticulous. She counts herself as like an old school bookkeeper. So she has all these records and keeps track of everything. They're old school, man. They're still balancing a checkbook. They're not using online banking like everybody else, man. They're writing it down. So she's going through it all. And she thought she had a handle on it. Uh, -uh. rocket money is saving them a whole bunch of cash. Let me explain how. Do you have any subscriptions you forgot about, or maybe you paid twice and didn't realize it? I did. My parents did too. Rocket money can cancel a subscription for you. And that is otherwise pretty time consuming. And I want you to know like 75% of people have subscriptions. They forgot about. We could not believe the number of subscriptions that showed up that we had forgotten about. My wife had signed up for a bunch of fitness apps. And of course, whatever the latest and greatest one is, she'd sign up for that one. But that meant she used the older ones less and less. And until the card expires, man, you may not ever even know. But between the different streaming services and all the different delivery services and all the fitness apps, it feels like it's never ending. But thanks to Rocket Money, you're no longer going to waste money on all the things you don't use anymore. And maybe you've been, you know, trying to save money for a while and it feels like you can't get any traction. Well, you probably got some seepage, my man. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that will find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions, monitor your spending, and help you lower your bills so you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, you have full control over all of your subscriptions and a clear view of your expenses. You can quickly see all the subscriptions you have in one place. And man, if you see something you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel it in just a few taps. It really is that easy. They even give you a dashboard that shows you this month's spending compared to last month. So you can even track your spending habits. All right. My wife doesn't like that part, but everything else she's on board with, they'll even help you create a custom budget. Keep that trending on spot. Uh, keep that spending on track and they can even help you negotiate to lower your bills. I can't believe this is real, but they can lower your bills by up to 20%. All you got to do is take a picture of your bill and rocket money will take care of the rest. Their customer service will handle it with the customer service for whatever service you're talking about. Rocket Money now has more than 5 million users. We're talking savings of over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. And most folks are saving up to $740 a year. Think about that. Rocket Money subscribers are saving $740 a year when they use all the app's features. How much can you save? Find out right now when you stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash 83 weeks. That's rocketmoney.com slash 83 weeks, rocketmoney.com slash 83 weeks. So Eric, you were saying you think perhaps maybe the ad buying process, the buyers and the relationships have maybe changed a little bit. Well, I, I think maybe culture's changed. And, and as a result, you know, things are not the same in the ad buying environment as they were even two or three years ago. And an example of that is, have you ever watched the show Gutfield? I have. Fox? I have. I saw um, what's the Tyrus on there once. It, yeah, I, I watch it regularly. It is a funny show. It's current events, current topics, but it's just, a, it's comedy. And it's, it's one of the highest rated late night comedy shows across the board, including Jimmy Kimmel and everybody else and outperform. So it's a funny, funny show. And I've noticed in the last six months or so that I've been watching it progressively, it started out slowly, but progressively they're just dropping F bombs and everything else on that show. Now they're, they're bleeped out, right? 
but it doesn't matter. You know they're there. In the past, even if you were able to bleep something out, it wasn't as bad as us hearing it, but advertisers and the ad agencies that we worked with got very sensitive about that. Either way, once or twice is, hey, sorry, it was an accident. It's the only way we could cover it up. Seven second rule, live TV. But if it happened consistently, you could lose advertisers as a result. They just didn't want to be in that environment. Right. And I think perhaps because things have changed so dramatically in, in entertainment with streaming and the competitive nature of it, it started out with the internet. You know, clients were spending more and more money advertising on the internet, which means they were spending less and less money advertising on television. This is going back to the 90s now, late 90s. Happened progressively even more and more through the 2000s. But I think now, and the, the fight to get eyeballs is so competitive, more so than it's ever been, that perhaps some of those barriers are coming down. And advertising agencies and their clients are just going, you know, this is the way things are going. And if we want to reach our customers, if we want to reach our, our target audience, we're just going to have to live in that environment. Maybe that's part of it too. What do you think of the, uh, the promo from SmackDown? Let's talk about that for a minute, because we saw the show start with the bloodline Roman reigns and, and the rest of the crew were out first. Uh, he cuts a promo hands, the Paul to my, uh, to, to Paul Heyman hands, the Paul hands, the mic to Paul, you know what I'm saying? And then they say, you're going to see the people's champ after this commercial break, Paul threw to a commercial from inside the ring. I just love that. We're. And by the way, I know that we, as, as viewers of the show may not enjoy that. I get that, but let me just tell you the value that an ad agency or an advertiser sees in that as, as part of no longer being a necessary evil, but really becoming almost a part of the show as silly as it may be and frustrating as it may be, if you're in the arena and everybody's just going to stand there for a few minutes for the television audience standpoint, that's huge. Here comes the rock. He cuts a really long promo. He's healing on the crowd, sort of putting a button on his social media promo. And that's when he lays out what the plan is. No, Cody Rhodes. I will not wrestle you one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to do a tag match on night one. And I know you'll love this part, Eric with steaks. Eric is big on steaks, not just fillets and ribeyes, but steaks in a match. The idea being if the rock and Roman reigns win, then it's bloodline rules on night two for Cody's world title shot. But if Cody and Seth win, the bloodline is banned. They're not even allowed to be at night two of WrestleMania. It's just Roman reigns. And you could see Paul Heyman's eyes twitching a little bit as he's saying all of this, but as if we needed another little, I don't know, uh, piece of popcorn to track back our steps. It seems like we know kind of what's going to happen now on, on night one. What'd you think of the execution of the promo and the laying out of the response and then the, the stakes for the new match. Again, I loved it for a lot of different reasons. We were 10 minutes into that promo before anybody said a word. Yes. 10 minutes and change. I think 1031 before any, before we heard our first syllable. How awesome is that? That's awesome. That's how you hold an audience. If you have the talent in the story behind it, right? That kind of matters. I love the way it was laid out. I'm not surprised at the way this is set up the stakes tag match first night kind of saw that coming way early on. I weren't sure. I wasn't sure how they were going to get into it, but given Seth's involvement at the press conference and Cody and the kind of things that have happened between Cody and Seth between, you know, beginning of the story with rock. And now it didn't surprise me at all that we were going to see a tag with Cody and Seth right. or rock and Roman saw that coming. Just didn't know how it was going to be set up, but now it's clear or is it, this is why I love this so much. Did you, if you go back and watch that promo, or perhaps you noticed the same thing I did. Maybe everybody did. And I just I'm hitting myself thinking that maybe I saw something unique, but from early on in that promo, just looking at facial expressions or lack thereof, right? Really. They're building heat between Roman and Rock. 
No doubt. Roman doesn't like being overshadowed. Now, and now it was so obvious in that promo, the storyline perspective. Acknowledge me. Yes. And then the hug after. That's like a mafia hug. Oh, I'm gonna hug. Oh, I'm gonna hug you right before I kill you, because that's yeah. how that works. Right. So there's more than one story or possible elements of, of one story that are evolving right before our eyes. That is a promo that tells a story, not just in the narrative of the promo, but in the subtle physical reactions of the talent in the, in the ring. And I want to back up one second. When, when you pointed out that Paul Heyman threw to a commercial break, yeah, that was really significant because for decades now, decades and decades and decades, whenever there was a throw to a commercial break, where did it come from? It came from the announcers, Michael Cole, the announce desk. Yeah. Yeah. And guess what? People tune announcers out. Yes, they do. They're just background noise yep. for the most part. No offense to announcers. I was one was one of my favorite jobs in professional wrestling, but it is what it is, right? Yes. But when you've got a talent in the ring throwing to a commercial break, that's as close as you could get to an in-ring sponsorship is that you can without actually having a product in your hand. That was really, really significant. And I, and I bring that up because people will go back and listen to what you said. You know, we have a, people, they throw to the break all the time. Yeah. Announcers do. Right. Not talent in the ring. That's right. a first in my book that I can ever recall. Probably am right. Very, very. I love that. That's the kind of thing that gets me excited. All right. Where did we leave off? Let's talk about, um, you know, we mentioned the, the drug use reference and the rock was about to close the promo lean down. If you smell, here comes Roman's hand. He wants one thing. Acknowledge me. He acknowledges him as his tribal chief fans start booing. They're chanting. You sold out. He reminds everybody rock being, he, this is family. Look at Heyman's face right there. And then, I mean, <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you the rock had. One of the funniest lines, they call it a callback in stand up comedy, but the way he closed the promo where he goes, now go home and smoke some more crack. I laughed out loud. I rewound it. I watched it again this morning over breakfast. I made Megan watch it because it just tickled me. Now go home and smoke some more crack. This is rock at his best. It was hilarious. It was well done, but the story wasn't finished because then they do their big bloodline pose. And just like they did last week, the rock joins in, but he's not just doing the regular old point up. He's got the thumb out for the L and Silva throw that back up. This time, Paul Heyman notices you see him taking a look like, wait a minute. Now look Dude, at Solo. that is, I didn't even notice that during the promo, but that is so cool. Look, look at, look at Uso, look at Solo, look at Roman. And now look at the rocks finger compared to everyone else's. And then look at Paul Heyman, the wise man observing and seeing what the hell's going on. And even when the rock was running through the stakes, man, it looked like Heyman was having an epileptic seizure or something. I mean, he was. The facials were off the charts. So, you know, I mean, listen, the, the clues lead you to believe we're still going to get our rock Roman match, but maybe it's going to be SummerSlam. But if you recall when Cody said in that first promo in Birmingham, when he was sort of tagging in the rock for his spot, I don't just want to take the title from you. I want to take everything from you. Well, here we go. The rock's going to try to destroy the bloodline and he's going to be a double agent for Cody. Cody's going to win the belt on night two, rah, rah, rah. But boy, now we've got something that we can count on and build towards for a really long time. Maybe once upon a time, the plan was to hot shot rock and Roman, but now it feels like if they want to, they could pay that off at SummerSlam or they could stretch it out a whole nother year at next year's WrestleMania for the first Netflix WrestleMania rock and Roman. But now we've got 
a real story. I'm a fan of it. I really thought they've Brian and, and Dwayne and Heyman and Bruce and Paul and whoever's got their fingerprints on this. This was really well done. I was a big fan of this. So well done. So well done. And this is a reason we can get, look, we're, we all love wrestling. We watch it. You know, there, there are periods in time when we're more excited about it than others, but this is one of those times. And I think the writing, the storytelling, the progressive nature of the story every week, it's getting more and more interesting. It's episodic. It's everything that I at least beat a drum about in terms of the way wrestling works best. It's not just an exhibition of people that can fly around and do crazy shit and cut their heads open with pliers and scissors and screwdrivers and bullshit. There is great storytelling. There is great performance in professional wrestling. And we're seeing it right now vis-a-vis the writing and the creative that's going into this. Going back to what I suggested her, you know, at the beginning of the show, I think they came into this WrestleMania situation with rock. They had one idea. Rod reacted in a way that nobody expected and they had to pivot and their pivoting effort that they put into that pivot is making the original story so much better. Yes. But it's good writing. It's little details, it's nuance, and it's making sure that the story progresses every single time. That's, that's a, that's a well, how many times have you heard me talk about a disciplined arc? This is an example of a well-disciplined arc. You know, what's cool too, Eric, they've really shown some patience. You know, like, uh, it would have been really easy and it felt like they were going to have to go very quickly just based on the timeline, but like, you know, Cody threw down the challenge last weekend, an elimination chamber. He wanted a match one-on-one since then we've had a raw, we've had an NXT and it took until SmackDown for the rock to respond. And Cody was at the SmackDown show. He wrestled in a dark match after the show, I believe. But we didn't have Cody in that segment. We didn't have Seth in that segment. We've really taken our time. And Rock even said, next week in Dallas, we're going to get your answer. They're really taking their time. They're not just trying to throw it all out there this week. I thought that was another thing they've done really, really well. And when you talk about discipline, that's what I think about. Because sometimes we've seen people trying to put, as we say in the South, 10 pounds of shit in a five-pound bag. That's not what we're doing here last night or, or, or Friday night was all about the rock and the bloodline. We'll get the answer from Cody and Seth next week on the show. I think they're going to do great ratings on, on the build for this. And, uh, this is about as good of execution as we could have expected. I think I, I agree a thousand percent. It is just, I don't know if it's perfect, but it's probably as close as we're going to see in live professional wrestling. It was so good. Just hats off to everybody involved on the creative side. I'm sure Brian is, is leading that charge, at least with regard to rock. Always had a lot of respect for Brian, but even more so now. Awesome. Kudos to all involved. Let's talk about something that your boy, your great close personal friend, Dave Meltzer has reported in the most recent observer. He says that John Cena is now tentative for WrestleMania. And if he does appear, The idea is for him to do something fun, short, and memorable. Of course, WWE is just full of talent right now. They've got a ton of stars and they don't just have one WrestleMania show. They've got two whole days worth. So they've got plenty of opportunity to do something with John. I want to mention that he has a new movie coming out later this week. Ricky Stanicki. Uh, it it also stars Zac Efron, who was the, the lead star from the iron claw. And, uh, the trailer looks absolutely phenomenal. It feels like he's got a lot of momentum outside of, of wrestling right now and popping back in for a huge WrestleMania. That's good for him. It's good for WWE, but it does make you wonder what will they do with him? If you were going to bring in John Cena, we saw last year, he wrestled Austin theory and Austin theory beat him. There wasn't really sufficient follow through for that. For me, what would you do with John Cena this year? Is there anybody on the roster that stands out to you that you think could do really, could be really served well by having that John Cena rub, or is there a scenario that you think just makes sense to plug him in right away? You know, I don't know what I would do with John so much that, you know, the answer to that would, would 
depend upon, you know, is, is John going to be available on a semi-regular basis or is this just a one-off? If it's a one-off, I'd probably involve him in an angle somehow, making an example, bad example, typical example, but, you know, making a save, integrating John at some point when you least expect him or a baby face needs some support and, and let him have that moment, let him share that reaction to the crowd, let him get somebody over and then, you know, let him go about his movie making business. If he's going to be back on a regular basis or even a semi regular basis once a month, once every two months, that's different Then maybe you can create some kind of a ongoing relationship uh, with the talent. But I would imagine this is a one-off. I just put them in the best possible light. I could let somebody else benefit from that as a part of an angle, so to speak, and just let it be at that as opposed to forcing him in unnecessarily. But there's so many things, you know, John's, John's a talented guy. He's a funny guy. There's probably a million other ways to use John, but just off the top of my head, that's how I would. I hope that he uh, gets a, uh, a good spot on not one, but both nights. I think John Cena is on the verge of becoming a much bigger Hollywood star. And I don't know how often we're going to get to see him do this sort of thing again. So let's, uh, let's enjoy it while we got it. By the way, speaking of enjoying it while we got it, can we talk about basketball here for a minute? Prize picks has made basketball so fun for me. Prize picks is now the largest daily fantasy sports platform in all of North America. We think it's the easiest and most exciting way to play because it's just you against the numbers. So instead of battling thousands of other players like the pros and the sharks, all you're doing is picking more than or less than on two to six different player stat projections. And you just watch the winnings roll in. You see football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's just no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. But we want you to get in on the excitement with prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win a hundred X your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. That's right. You can turn 10 bucks into a thousand dollars with the NBA, NHL and college basketball entries all on prize picks. America's number one daily fantasy sports app. By the way, those conference tournaments are here and that means the biggest moments in college basketball are getting closer. Be part of the action for both men and women's college basketball. I want to mention prize picks has injury insurance. Let me explain your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So for basketball games, if you have a player who exits in the first half and does not return in the second half, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stay live. I don't know of anybody else who's doing that. I think you're going to love it. Prize picks is really simple to play. You make your picks and get submitted with your entries in less than 60 seconds. They've got quick withdrawals. They've got easy gameplay. They've got an enormous selection of players and stat types. That's why we think prize picks is the number one daily, daily fantasy sports app. They've even just added Apple pay. So it's easy to get going all in time for basketball season. Check it out. Here's how easy it could be. I think Steph Curry is going to get more than 29 points. I think Joe kick is going to get less than 10 rebounds. That's it. Boom. You're, you're, you're live pal. Download the app today and use our code 83 weeks for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. We're talking about prize picks y'all download the app and use our code 83 weeks for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So we are excited to see John Cena doing whatever he might do at WrestleMania. Uh, I do want to ask you about a little bit of a controversy over the weekend. Maxine Dupree was booed at a house show and man, it became a hot button issue. Um, Dave Meltzer would say this led to Ripley and Vega making social media posts. Ripley wrote, I really wish that some of you got booed and ridiculed in the public eye while being new at your job. Learning and getting better is all part of being human. Be better as humans. Vega wrote, this is absolutely horrible. She doesn't deserve that. She's such a kind soul and really works hard. I would love if the bad parts of the biz don't harden her heart. They probably just mad because they can't drink your bath water, Maxine. 
And of course, a lot of fans have been, uh, drawing a line in the sand about if this is out of bounds or not. Dave Meltzer was saying pretty clearly he doesn't think that booing someone because they're not very good is rude. Now, if you're saying something that's sexist, or if you're saying something that's homophobic or some sort of awful slur, then hell yeah, we need to kick your ass out of there. But the idea that fans shouldn't be allowed to boo, whether you're cheering or you're booing, why ever you're cheering or you're booing, that's part of the game. They bought a ticket. They've earned that right. But I appreciate the ladies on the roster coming to support Maxine. What do you think of this? I don't like the fact that Bia and, and, uh, sorry, what's her Vega keep forgetting her current name. Um, I, I don't like them. That's, that's to me, that's exactly how you don't use social media. Right. I don't want to know what you're really like. I want to buy into your character. I don't want to know your feels or your virtues. I want to believe in your character, especially when you're promoting your social media under your character name with your character images. I I just, I don't want that. I want social media as a fan. I appreciate and enjoy talent, use their social media and stay within character. That's just me. And the other reason I don't like it is because it's all it's going to do is encourage more bad behavior. You're acknowledging bad behavior. What happens when you acknowledge bad behavior in social media? You get more of it. It just doesn't make any sense to me to try to use social media to mitigate or soften a situation like we're talking about. As far as the talent is concerned, Suck it up, babe. You're in the entertainment business. Yeah. Conrad, you, you, you know, Casio and Cody Forcer and some of the other people that you hang with and friends that you've met that are stand, Shuli. How many of those people that you know that have that make a living as professional stand-up comics have never been booed? Yeah. It's part of the process. You have to learn. And you certainly have to learn how to toughen up and not be emotionally affected by it. If you're going, if you're that sensitive and you're going to be affected so badly by somebody booing you because you had a bad night, then you're in the wrong business. Suck it up. Use it. Turn it around. Do some jujitsu on that shit and make it work for you as opposed to working against you and ask your friends not to feel sorry for you publicly because all that's going to do is encourage people to do it even more. I think it was a mistake as far as should fans or shouldn't they, is it a rule? Did they step over the line? I fucking hate the fact that I'm going to agree with shit stained Dave Meltzer, but he, even he gets it right once in a while you're coming to an event. So people can express extreme emotion, cheering, booing, if you're lucky, throwing stuff and getting so emotional that they lose control. That's your job. So if you have a job where you know you're soliciting and trying to create extreme emotion amongst an audience and spending good money to go there and just let that shit loose and you happen to have a bad night and get booed, suck it up. Any questions? Anybody know? Anybody have any idea how I really feel about this? Let me ask you a question here, Eric. Like, I know that people were saying, well, she's only had like 10 matches. It was a house show, guys. Where is she supposed to wrestle? Like, it's not like they carted her out on TV. This happened at a house show. That's where you're supposed to work the kinks out of shit. 
I mean, yeah, and that's where you're supposed to, when things go bad, learn how to deal with it. Yes. Okay. What went wrong? Go back behind the curtain instead of crying and moping and rushing to your fucking Instagram or whatever it is you're doing. Well, no, she didn't do any of that. Friends. I know she didn't do it. I'm not putting the heat on her, but I'm just saying, instead of going back and being mopey about it, maybe she wasn't, maybe she's doing exactly what I'm going to suggest. Maybe what she was doing was she walked back through that curtain. She went, okay, that sucked. Crowd hated that. What did I do wrong? Can we talk about that match? Tell me how I could have improved. What should I have done? What should I not have done to get the reaction I got? Learn from it and then go have a pizza or whatever it is you're going to do when the show's over. But don't, don't, you know, it's it's just a mopey, whiny, virtue signaling, just bullshit. Tired of it. Tired of it. I love Rhea Ripley as a character. I don't know her as a person. Had a little bit of a conversation with her a couple months ago. Did a very nice thing for a good friend of mine. And, and classy, 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 but keep feels to yourself unless your feels are consistent with your character. Let's talk about a character who we both think a lot of drew McIntyre. I, uh, was speculating that he was going to be a big part of WrestleMania a few weeks ago. And I think you said, isn't this contract about up? And I thought, and I kind of said, nah, I don't think that's an issue. And I got blown up in my DMS saying, oh, that's all wrong. His contract's not, uh, uh, not signed. He's going to be leaving blah, blah, blah. Well, now the talk is Drew has officially re-signed with WWE surprise, surprise. He's in the main, he's not in the main event, but he's challenging Seth Rollins for the world title at WrestleMania. Yeah. Uh, he's sticking around and by the way, no disrespect, but if you're Drew McIntyre, why would you go anywhere else? I know there's a lot yeah. of people who were fighting for television time on, on both channels, whether it's AEW or it's WWE, but Seth's getting a lot of television time. Seth is getting good storylines. Seth is in a featured match at WrestleMania. Now ain't the time to say I'm frustrated and I'm leaving. I think you if said any- Seth, you meant, you said Seth, you meant Drew. I meant Drew. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And and again, this is going to be all, oh, Bischoff hates Tony Gunn. I don't hate Tony Gunn. I don't hate AEW. But just think about it. Be very, very honest with yourself, you people. Even you Kool-Aid drinking muckle that think that AEW is the best thing since sliced bread. Guess what? It ain't. Take a look, take a look at the people that have left WWE to go to AEW and see where they're at in their careers. Ah, why would anybody go there? You're a star of Drew's magnitude so that you can end up in the AEW witness protection program or wrestling in front of 2,500 people uh, for, for a dynamite. Eh, why would you do that? It's silly. You're going to, he's going to go where the money is. And right now the money's in WWE and he's in a great position. And I'm sure that everybody knew that this contract was going to get closed. If it hadn't already been closed months before this. Yes. Perhaps it wasn't finalized. Perhaps my attorney is going to send it to your attorney and, oh, we've got to change a few things here. Non-material items. Just want to clean it up a little bit. Not sure I understand this. <clears throat> the process of attorneys going back and forth with, with agreements, as you know, contract Conrad, can take an excruciating amount of time. But I'm sure everybody had a meeting of the mind a long time ago. I, uh, I, for one, am really excited to see what they do with Drew. I think I like his character more now than I have his entire run. Uh, I think WWE has just got the hot hand in a lot of ways right now. But one of the things they may not have the hot hand in is legal battles with old Court Bauer. It was officially made public on the TKO investor call that there was a $20 million settlement with MLW and Dave Meltzer would note this. An interesting note is that since this was settled in December and the money was paid in 2023, MLW had a bigger profit for the year than any pro wrestling company other than WWE, not only for this year, but for any company other than WWE, except for WCW in 1997 and 1998. Now, of course he's having some fun with that because by the time it's all divvied up, he's got to pay attorneys and. I know his wife's an attorney and his family's attorneys, but still, it just feels like maybe that's a little cart before the horse to say they're the most profitable, yada, yada. But 20. No, I don't think it is. You know? I think it's probably accurate. Uh, I would be. 
I, first of all, I don't think it's actually 20 million is the profit. I, that's what I'm saying is after costs and expenses and all that jazz, I don't know if that's necessary. Well, typically if, if, if now I didn't know that his wife is an attorney, did his wife handle this case? I'm not sure, but I do know okay. that I shouldn't say I know. I believe that whatever happened in this MLW case is probably related to why one of the reasons maybe Stephanie stepped aside originally. And I also believe, again, I have nothing, it's just a gut feeling, but I have a feeling that when all of a sudden after out of the blue, seemingly McDivitt steps down and retires, that's the, that's the point buddy, of that they had something somewhere that was cod locked because we've heard forever that WWE has the best attorneys in the game. And when this lawsuit hits somewhere in the middle of it, the guy who's been the face of all those victories, he just. He's out of here. And now they cut a $20 million check. They had something pretty damn concrete. I don't want to speculate as to what that is. I think we've all heard different rumors and innuendo, but the idea was that they were trying to, if you recall the genesis of this lawsuit, they were trying to accuse WWE of basically having a monopoly and unfair business practices and tampering with their television deal. And I guess MLW had a television deal and now they don't, they could actually show damages for that. $20 million here. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Let's back that up a little. So it's a $20 million lawsuit. Let's, let's assume, um, big assumption here, but let's assume a law firm took that on a contingency. Yes. That means that law firm would have, would probably take a third. Yeah. 33%. Yeah. So you're taking about 7 million right off the top. Yes. Now you're down to 13 million. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. I'm sure there's an attorney out there that will correct me. But unlike personal injury damages that come vis-a-vis a lawsuit. Right. So in other words, if you you rear end me and and I break my back and blah 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 and I spent 2 months in a hospital and surgeries and all that that and I sue you and I get a check for a hundred dollars for that lawsuit. That's not taxable as a personal injury, a business dispute. I don't know. It could very well be considered taxable income. So let's say you got $13 million and oh, okay, well about 50% of that's going to go to taxes. So now you're down to about 7 million down, down to about 7 million. But that's a far cry from 20 million, isn't it? But I think your your point about Jerry McDivitt, that Jerry loved to fight. That's why Jerry and Vince McMahon have been so tight since going back to the steroid trial. Jerry McDivitt is a fighter. He would rather fight than fuck. He is that, <laughs> kind, of, he is that kind of a fighter, and he's good at it. For whatever reason, whether it was McDivitt's retirement, whether it was something that was part of this lawsuit, that forced a change of attorney, whatever it was, where Jerry McDivitt is no longer no longer leading the charge, that was probably a sea change in the way WWE is going to conduct business in the future from a legal perspective. And clearly there was something. Here's another point that I want to make. Again, a good attorney or any attorney, probably fresh out of Attorney school, what do they call that? Oh, yeah, law school. Could probably correct me on this. But in a situation where there's contract tampering, tortious interference is the legal term. Yeah. It is considered a tort claim, which has attached what they call treble damages. So if I say, well, Conrad fucked around with my contract and you see, I could show you that I would have made a hundred dollars if Conrad wouldn't have fucked around on my contract. And the judge goes, yep, Conrad's a bad dude. You know, judgment for the plaintiff. Here's your hundred. Oh no, it's not a hundred dollars because it's a tortious interference claim. It's $300 or yeah. $500. Three I'm not X, sure what the bulk, three. what is it? Three X three. Yeah. Yeah. So there's trouble damages in there. So conceivably, Conceivably, MLW court was able to show damages in around seven. six or seven million dollars. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I, here's what I would say to court. 
take that money, invest it, buy a nice little house on the beach, and consider your excursion into the professional wrestling business a huge success and hold on to your well, personal advice. I, uh, I think he's already got the house on the beach and I agree with you. I think it would be time to cash out. I don't know if the rumor in innuendo is true. Maybe he has some, some investors. Maybe this, uh, keeps them going a little longer. I hope if he wants to keep going, he does keep going. I, I mean, I, I know they're still promoting shows. I don't know if those were buildings that were booked in advance, but I think he sees the big vision. I think he, for better or worse is a wrestling lifer. And I think it's probably not a bad thing to have, you know, maybe a, a little war chest there for MLW. If they are trying to level up anything that gives guys more reps on TV, I'm, I'm a, a fan of, and they got some entertaining acts over there. Like our pal, Mance Horner. And man, you would love micro man. If you haven't seen him before, lots of fun stuff with MLW and high five, man, $20 million. Not a lot of people get a $20 million check from WWE. So kudos to them. I just read a report that America is now in more credit card debt than ever before. More than $1.1 trillion. You know, my grandfather used to say there's no stress like money stress, son. Well, are you feeling that right now? Let me help. You've got a friend in the mortgage business and me, and I've helped families just like yours save hundreds of dollars a month. Seriously. We've helped listeners to this podcast save up to 800 bucks a month. At SaveWithConrad.com, we routinely help our podcast listeners consolidate all of their high interest rate credit cards into just one much lower monthly payment. Would you like to lower your monthly payments? Wouldn't it be nice to skip your next two house payments? Are you finally ready for some breathing room and peace of mind? Start saving money today with your friend in the mortgage business, me at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. You see at savewithconrad.com, we don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We want to be your mortgage advisor for life. So find out how easy it is to finally get rid of your credit card debt once and for all, get a much lower monthly payment, and even skip your next two house payments. Let's find out how much money you can save for free at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 32416, Equal Housing Lender, savewithconrad.com. Uh, let's talk a little bit about TNA. It was reported in The Observer that there's been some discussion that they might actually look at taking up residency in a soundstage, not just any old soundstage, Full Sail University. That's right, the same place where TNA used to, uh, or I'm sorry, NXT used to do their shows back in the day. The Observer says Ed Nordham, Scott Demore, and Lou D'Angeli had made a connection with Full Sail University in Orlando as a location. It recently toured the camps after Demore was let go and Nordholm was removed from the picture. Leonard Asper and other execs were also said to be interested and toured Full Sail. The original plan for a test weekend taped shows at the new location, whether Full Sail or somewhere else, in May or June. With the idea of starting up going live each week late in 2024 or early in 2025. Now, I found that interesting for a variety of reasons. First of all, full sale to me will always be associated with NXT. So I like the idea of it's no longer just the TNA soundstage that we've used in Orlando forever. Full sale, we know, looks cool. It's familiar to wrestling fans, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea that they're looking to go live. Man, that could be very, very costly as TNA found out once upon a time when you were there, but if it's done right, it could be very, very effective. We saw how effective it was for nitro. What do you think about this new discussion of should they go live every week and could it work at full sale as opposed to a touring live show? Will it work would to be able to answer, will it work or not would require both of us, either of us having a better understanding of what their goals are right? and the expenses, costs, talent, uh, all that. Here's, it won't make any difference to their bottom line. It was, as you pointed out, TNA found out it was expensive. That's only if you tour, you know, going to different arenas and having to fill up arenas and traveling all over 
the country and not having a set location. That's where the, the actual shooting a show, especially in today's environment, shooting a show live versus shooting it and post-producing it. It's not the cost of production that is such a hurdle. It's the travel and the setup that goes along with it. Right. So if, if they if they've got a home base and they're not traveling per se on a, on a weekly basis, then live aspect isn't going to be that dramatic. Not going to be that big of a hit. But it's also not going to, you know, you mentioned well, work for Nitro. Nitro toured. The tour, touring live is what worked for Nitro, which is one of the reasons WWE followed suit and started doing what we were doing and presenting live every week. It's one of the reasons AEW is live every week because we proved the model that live television is more interesting, but only if it tours and you've got a crowd that, that becomes a part of the show. Being live in a soundstage is just the difference between being live in a soundstage and being taped in a soundstage from a, a net net perspective, as far as the audience is not going to make it. So the audience won't care. It's not the same as touring. It's not the same as being in an arena. You don't get the same energy in a soundstage that you get in an arena in front of a live, real audience. Not that this audience won't be a real audience. They're live human beings. They're real people, I know. But these are probably much like TNA was when TNA was in Orlando, is you're going to get the same core of people there each and every week, and you're not going to get same vibe, the same reaction, the same energy out of that audience that you would if you were touring. So I, 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 at the end of the day, I just don't think it's really going to be significant one way or the other. It'll be neutral. We should mention that they have had uh, a lot of success recently. Uh, Meltzer would say to say hard to kill, which is their most recent pay-per-view from Las Vegas was an overwhelming success would be an understatement. It ended up doing 19,700 buys on television pay-per-view. <laughs> Let me take a timeout right there. That means not through fight or some of the streaming services, not a digital buy on a website or a laptop or a computer. But if you're ordering through cable or direct TV or dish or whatever, and you have the remote and you hit the button, 19,700 buys there. Meltzer would continue. That's more than double the prior pay-per-view bound for glory, which did under 6,900 on TV. And that was considered a huge success. The show ended up doing far more than even the Kenny Omega, rich Swan champion versus champion show. If you factor in streaming buys, this should end up at around $60,000, which would be the same as the Samoa Joe Kurt angle record that was set at TNA Genesis in 06. The idea they did this off access is absolutely mind blowing. Obviously the curiosity about the return to the TNA name was a key part of the draw, but the fact is this hasn't led to a follow-up ticket sa ticket sales picking up and, and ratings for the show have been out of top 150 most weeks of late. This was actually one system that caters or there was actually one system that caters to rural areas where they actually beat AEW worlds in, which makes no sense at all. So let's just time out right there. I know you sort of chuckled when I said 19,700 buys, but when you factor in streaming, 60,000 buys means it's at least in the conversation to be the most watched TNA pay-per-view in history. And they did this without 2 million people watching on spike or whatever they used to do. They did it on AXS, a station most people struggle to even find, but they had some buzz. They had some momentum. And then they fired Scott Demore. I just can't wrap my head around it, man. Like you've got the high watermark for pay-per-view at a incredible disadvantage television wise. Ah, get out of here. Hit the bricks. It's crazy to me. There had to be something more to it. It'd be something personal. I, I, I don't know. Scott Demore. seems a little bit. I've heard about him few conversations I've had with people that have worked with him. He's an amiable guy. He doesn't have an abrasive personality. Smart. Passionate about the business. Something, I don't know. I don't want to get into rumor margering or, or cultivate those who do it, but it's got to be something else going on. 
We still know. About it. I mean, listen, there was rumor in any window that he was actually trying to buy the thing. Yeah, but you don't fire a guy for coming to you and saying, Hey, I'll give you a couple bucks if you want to sell it. I think, it, I think perhaps what it came down to was, and I don't know that everybody knows this, but Scott Demore is a wildly successful businessman. He's got his family business that has been very lucrative for generations and said differently. He doesn't need wrestling. This is his fun thing that he does and he's great at it and has a lot of great relationships with the people who were on that team over on TNA and the rumor and innuendo that I heard is that perhaps there were some disagreements about the way the show should be ran with, res- with respect to expenses. I think you and I as business guys, we understand that totally makes sense, but perhaps happens he wanted to day. happens every day. Maybe he wanted to run it his way and he felt like that's what was best for the brand. But it's just, uh, man, it's disheartening to think, man, with this leadership and this decision making, they just had their biggest, most successful pay per view of all. And the guy who did it is now on the outside looking in. That's just weird to me. Yeah, it is weird. It'll be interesting to see what happens going forward because if, you know, all all the success that you were just talking about, the pay per view and the records and all that indicates that there's a growth going on there. Boom. Let's get rid of Scott DeMore, the guy that arguably is responsible, not solely, but partially in, in large part to that success. Let's cut him loose because we have a disagreement about how the show should be run, budgeting. Let's see what happens over the next six months. If they lose that momentum, you know, Scott may be getting a call. It sounds a little bit like my, my experience in WCW, when I first went to Brad Siegel, wow. said, Hey Brad, you might want to think about selling this company while it's still worth something. And of course, Brad looked at me and chuckled and said, <laughs> Eric, you know, this company never sells anything. We only buy things. Okay, Brad. Cool. Six months later. So Eric, are you kind of serious about finding somebody to buy it? Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? It does. Um, who knows? Scott, keep your phone turned on. Well, I mean, if you recall, you may, be getting, you may be getting that phone call when this news first happened. And when we, when we first discussed it here on 83 weeks, uh, I said, I thought it winds up with his hands and, and I, and I hope it does. And, uh, something else I hope is that you guys will check out factor eating better is easy with factors, delicious, ready to eat meals. These are fresh, never frozen meals. That have been chef crafted, dietitian approved, and man, they're ready to go in just two minutes. You've got over 35 different options to choose from every single week. Things like calorie smart, protein plus, and even keto. There's more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. What are you waiting for? Get started today and get after your goals. There's two minute meals. That means you can fuel up fast with factors, restaurant quality meals. They're ready to heat and eat wherever and whenever. They've also got your other stuff covered like pancakes and smoothies and more. They can handle all your midday bites, your snacks, and even breakfast. There's no prep. There's no mess. All you do is heat and eat. No more prepping, no more cooking, no more cleanup. And it really is as flexible as your schedule. Think about that. It's in the fridge, two minutes in the microwave, and bam, you're ready to go. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. So maybe if you think, Hey man, uh, the wife's out of town this week, I'm going to be fending for myself. Let me get a few extra, or you know what? We're going to run out of town. I don't need as many. That's easy to do. I know because I've done it. I'm a big believer in factor. I have to be honest. We've had a bunch of these type sponsors on the program. Factor is the one that my wife and I continue to order, even when they're not sponsoring our program, because it tastes freaking great. I mean it. When they say restaurant quality, a lot of people say that, and it's not really true. It is here. You, if you plated this thing, you would be given high fives all around and say, who the hell cooked that? Uh, but thankfully we don't do that in my house. We just eat it right in the container. It comes in. It's that easy. You want to talk about fast, easy, delicious, and oh yeah, affordable factor really is perfect. If you're looking for fast premium options with no cooking required, and you can sign up and save, we've done the math. And factor is less expensive than takeout. And remember every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Head on over to factormeals.com slash 83 weeks, 50 and use our code 83 weeks, 50, and you'll get 50% off. 
That's code 83 weeks, 50 at factormeals.com slash 83 weeks, 50, and you'll get 50% off. So listen, we got to talk a little bit about Tony Khan's media call this week. Uh, I know that, uh, we talked about revolution and Sting's last match and all that that's available in the archives. We did a live pre-show and a live post-show and the, uh, the best and easiest way to get that is to just go check us out on YouTube. If you haven't already go right now to 83 weeks.com hit the subscribe button and be sure to turn on the notifications bell. So you won't miss it. The next time we're live, you'll actually get to ask Eric questions live. He's on camera. Bring what you got. He's ready for it. 83 weeks.com. But I bring this media call up to you because Tony Khan was asked about the profitability of the company. And he said that when the new media rights deal goes into effect in 2025, there will be a big bump. And from that point forward, the company will be profitable. He believes for decades, and this deal will put them over the top. He said all three shows. Rampage on Friday night, dynamite on Wednesday night, collision on Saturday night. The exact quote. We'll get huge increases for sure. End quote. He says 2025 will be the year they go from startup company to a profitable established challenger brand. And they will be successful from that point on for decades. Khan is still at this time under an exclusive in that all things AEW can only be negotiated with Warner brothers discovery. That's a note from Dave Meltzer, but man, not only is he predicting that they're going to get a bump, but he thinks this is going to be a bump that serves as like the foundation of AEW for decades to come. What say you sounds to me like the deal's already been negotiated. Certainly seems like they've had conversations, right? And if that's the case, I'm sure we'll be seeing AEW and, and we'll have a real, um, high profile visibility, um, during the cable upfronts deals already done. And Tony Khan is convinced and is absolutely sure that all three shows are going to get a significant bump. He knows something that we all don't know. And we'll be seeing them at, at the cable upfronts or Tony's delusional. And is out there hyping something that he shouldn't be hyping, making comments in public about a negotiation that should be, I guess, proprietary, usually is. But we'll find out. You know, he he may be right. Tony may absolutely know something none of us know, and and as a result, has enough confidence to go out and publicly state that all three shows are going to be paid significantly more. Than they have been previously. If that's the case, congratulations. Find out. We will find out. I am, uh, I for one am excited to, uh, to see what happens. Obviously that's great for wrestling. I know that there's a lot of tribalism in wrestling, but if you're somebody who is rooting for AEW to fail and to not get a huge increase in television rights said differently, you're basically saying you don't like professional wrestling or professional wrestlers. It's good for the industry and the people within it and the people trying to consume it at home, for there to be an alternative, even if you don't like it, even if you don't watch it, it's just good that it's there. Uh, so I, for one, am hoping that man, a lot of people, uh, feel safe and comfortable in their jobs and their, their place in the business and the industry. And I hope it happens. You know, it, it would be hard for me to imagine that they're wildly profitable right now, but depending on what these rights fees look like, I guess they could be. Do you think the, the, the numbers will be disclosed, Eric? I mean, when do you think we'll, we'll learn those or will we learn those? Because it's not a publicly traded company. We'll only know those numbers. If Turner Warner brothers discovery wants the public to know them. And I can't imagine that there would be an upside to that. Why would they? Because they're, they're they're tipping their hat to other producers of programming, to agents. Why, why would you do that? So I don't know. Unless there's a reason for it, I, I doubt that we're going to hear it. I, I don't think that Tony Khan or anybody in AEW would be out there publicizing it if it wasn't if there wasn't some provisions within their agreement that 
They only do so if they're permitted to do so by Warner Brothers Discovery, which would normally be the case. Having had quite a bit of experience selling programs as a producer to various networks, including Discovery, every one of those agreements had significant uh, language in them that prevented either Jason or I from disclosing any details of our, our agreement that wasn't authorized by, by the network. So I'm sure that's probably, or some version of that is probably true with AEW. So we'll only know if, if Warner Brothers Discovery wants us to know. Let's, uh, let's talk on some uh, sad news here. I want to remind everybody, if you're looking for sting talk or revolution talk, it's available now, 83 weeks.com over on YouTube. But Eric, we, uh, man, we had a bad run this past week. It's been said that deaths often come in threes and in our little wrestling community, man, we got all three this past week. We'll start uh, with our most recent loss, Eric. Paul Vachon, Butcher Vachon, the brother of Mad Dog Vachon, the adoptive father of Luna Vachon, the former father-in-law of Gangrel, sadly passed away on Leap Year Day, February 29th, 2024, at 86 years old. My man had been wrestling since 1957. He lived a full life, goodness gracious. He spent some time in the AWA. Well, he was a territory guy, you know, he had some runs in New York and the NWA and down in Georgia. Did you ever run across Paul Vachon in the AWA? I did not. I did not. Mad Dog Vachon, yes. Paul Vachon, no. Mad Dog Vachon, before I ever broke into the professional wrestling business, is one of my favorite characters in the AWA. He had some of the craziest promos. One in particular, I remember, I don't remember who his opponent. But Mad Dog was, he had like a carpenter's apron on and, and tools, and he was on a set, and he was building a casket scratch for his opponent. Cut his promo while he was building this casket. I just, I don't know why that stands out in my mind. It was so absurd. And then I met, again, not Paul, but Mad Dog at Slamboree 93, I think, perhaps. And by that time, um, Mad Dog, Paul's, brother had been hit by a car, lost his lower leg as a result. So he had a fake leg and I was backstage. Everybody was around. All the old guys were around talking and that dog took off his leg and passed it around. So everybody could play with it, hopping around on one leg in the locker in character, completely in character, but I did not meet Paul. If he was anything like his brother, he had to be an amazingly fun, scary character to be around. Imagine that family reunion of Sean's. Right. Like Luna, all get together. Gangrel, Mad Dog, Butcher. That's a group of folks you don't want to mess Can with. Can you imagine that one? Can you yeah, imagine them just well, yeah, they get together, they're barbecuing a ham or something, or a turkey out back in the summertime. Everybody's passing around beers or cocktails or whatever. And then things escalate. You know how they do with family get togethers. You know, all that hidden resentment and anger over stupid shit all of a sudden comes to the top when everybody gets drunk drinking and then they start cutting promos on each other. What a hell of a party that would have been. Bro. Can you imagine, uh, if that group made a, if that family was doing like a road trip and they pulled into some sort of dive bar or restaurant, maybe it's just like a family restaurant, even like, just a cracker barrel. Can you imagine if a Sean's pulling into a cracker barrel? No, ah! that'd be fun. What a visual. Well, man, what if, what a legendary wrestling family, uh, 86 years old though, man, he got, he got all he could out of this life. And, and that's not the case for the guy who we all know and love who passed away the day before I was first introduced to him on WWF programming as Virgil. When he came over to work with you in WCW, you decided to, Hey, let's sort of tongue in cheek. They named him Virgil, which was dusty Rhodes' real name. We'll call him Vincent or Vincent Kennedy McMahon. The real life Mike Jones, who no longer with us, just 61 years old. God, he was so young. It's just crazy to even think about. Um, I mean, that was the, the, the age that was reported. It's, it's pretty amazing when you think about 
the controversy around his death, because there's been a little bit of discussion. Is he 61 or is he 72? He, I guess through the years gave different ages, maybe in an effort to stay in the game, no matter if he was 61 or 72, man, he just had a rough run of health. A few years ago, he was, uh, found to have colon cancer, I believe. And I understand he suffered from a few strokes and dementia and unfortunately passed away on the 28th. But man, you want to talk about a guy who was there at the two peaks of professional wrestling, at least in my mind, the golden age of the WWF, call it 88, 89, 90, 91, all in there. And then of course, when the company or the industry got really hot again with the NWO in the late nineties, he was there late eighties. Mike Jones is there late nineties. Mike Jones is there. Uh, an important part of wrestling history, no longer with us, man. You got to know him a little bit. Tell us about Mike Jones. He was a happy guy. Talked a little bit about this on Strictly Business with Elba last week. Um, the last time I saw Mike, I was at an autograph signing in Albany, New York. Yeah, downtown Albany, actually. And Mike was there, and I got to the building, and it, you know, I wasn't a big wasn't a big event, but I got there and Mike came, I saw him coming. I had just gotten set up at my table and I saw him coming from across the venue and he had something in his hand. He came running over to me and I know I'd seen Mike, you know, wrestling conventions, signings, events. It wasn't unusual to, to cross paths a couple times a year. But I saw Mike coming over. He was beelining towards me. He had something in his hand. He came up and he handed me this picture of he and I together and he signed it to me. To my friend Eric, thanks for everything. And handed it to me, and I set it off the side. And he was just smiling, happy. You could tell he was just thrilled to be there at that event. And it was a small little convention; it wasn't a big deal. But he was so happy. And it, it, when I heard that he passed, it reminded me of really Mike Jones backstage when he was in WCW. He was always smiling. He was always happy to be there. And the rest of the roster had a lot of respect for Mike, not because he was the greatest wrestler, not because he was the greatest character, but because he loved being there. He loved being a part of it. He loved being a part of it when he was there with the NWO and possibly arguably the peak of the NWO era. He was there and he was having fun. And he was having just as much fun in Albany the last time I saw him when he ran over and gave me a picture of him. That's what I remember, Mike. Just a happy, fun guy. That's the piece. He uh, comes into uh, the NWO or WCW at a time when the NWO was just hotter than ever. Was that at the urging, you think, of DiBiase, Hogan, how does that idea come to be? Do you recall? I don't really recall who was the catalyst. Uh, it could have easily been Ted. It could have just as easily been Hulk. Could have been somebody else. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint. Who raised their hand in a room and said, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we bring in Mike Jones? Put him in the NWO. I couldn't tell you who came up with the idea, but universally, everybody was excited to have him there. Because again, everybody, everybody on the NWO side had respect for me. It's, um, it was a fun run for him in WCW. Uh, and I know it was maybe when things weren't exactly booming the way they were with the NWO, but his participation in the West Texas rednecks, curly bill, that's funny shit. <laughs> and a great sense of humor too. He did. He had great timing. It was, uh, and you know, he was even, you know, his meat sauce gimmick. And yeah. all, I mean, he was, he still had his finger on the pulse in a way long after, you know, he saw the red light of a camera, He's just a character. He was born a character. Shout out to, uh, his entire family and all of his friends who, who loved him. I know Paige and those guys are pretty tore up. I mean, they had a lot of fun with him and certainly gave him a new life on social media. Saw a really fun tribute from Joey Janela too. 
by all accounts, Mike Jones just, uh, loved living life, man. And, uh, big part of my childhood, man, his turn with million dollar man, when I was a kid, unbelievable. And I got to tell you it only coming out now, sort of more mainstream that the dude just shaved 11 years off of his life and just gave a working date of birth to keep working was just amazing. How wrestling that. is that? Yeah. That's let's see what I mean. He just, he was born for the business. <laughs> I mean, he would tell people he was born in 62. He was born in 51. It's unbelievable. I mean, I talked to DDP earlier this week and he was like, man, do you believe he was 61 years old? And I'm thinking, right. Sure enough. I did a little digging and, and, and it's out there. 72. Uh, somebody who lived uh, a little longer than that, uh, was somebody that you got to know pretty well for better or worse. And in WCW, Ole Anderson, we lost Ole, unbelievably just two days prior to, uh, Mike Jones, February 26th. We lost Ole on the 26th. We lost Mike on the 28th and we lost Mr. Rashawn on the 29th. Ole had been sick for a long, long time. I don't pretend to be, uh, close with anyone in his circle, but I used to be pretty good friends with, um, with Peggy Lathan. I know she was pretty tight with Ole. She unfortunately passed away a few years ago. So when I heard the news about Ole passing away, the first person I thought about was Peggy, but I knew through Peggy that Ole had not been well for years. So in, in a lot of ways, it's probably a blessing that he's no longer in pain, but I bet like everything else in Ole's life, he was going to do it when he was good and damn ready. Uh, what can you tell us about your time with Ole Anderson? I liked Ole a lot when, before I, before I got any power in WCW, Ole and I, you know, I guess maybe a little bit of the Minnesota connection. I think Ole had a, a lot of respect for Vern. I think the fact that I came out of Vern's mentorship, so to speak, uh, coming out of AWA, I think I automatically got a little bit of a hall pass with Ole um, as a result. And, and we got along great for a long time. Uh, you like the fact that I was an amateur wrestler in high school and college. You got a kick out of that. We'd, you know, wrestle around back in the production office every once in a while. And just, it, it had, a, had a lot of fun with Ole. He, he was, he had a great sense of humor. If, if he was comfortable around you, um, if he wasn't comfortable around you, he was just the biggest jackass on the planet. It was either one or the other. There was not a lot of middle ground with Ole. Very little, if any, gray area. You knew exactly whether or not Ole was comfortable around you, liked you. I don't think he liked a lot of people, but comfortable around you, or he wasn't. And, uh, you know, obviously once I took over WCW and he ended up working for me, I think that was tough on him. Some resentment there. And I think Ole in general resented anything and everyone that had progressed in the business once he stopped, once Ole was no longer the booker or a, a main character in a, in a program, once, once Ole had to kind of be on the sidelines and, and coach people from the sidelines or try to build, um, you know, in the case of Ole Anderson, the live event business, um, he wasn't comfortable. Ole wasn't comfortable in the office. He hated it. He hated coming to the office. Um, and he was miserable in that environment, but it was tough. He was stubborn, much like Vern Gagne was stubborn, much like Bill Watts was stubborn. And these are guys that came up and experienced a tremendous amount of success in, in the business at a time when their way of conducting business worked. But once it no longer worked and the business evolved, Ole was kind of frustrated. Sometimes that frustration would come out at the worst possible times. But I tend to think back when, when I first heard Ole pass, I thought back to him and I fucking around back in a post-production studio and, and just having fun. I choose not to remember the crabby part of Ole because, you know, we, we all experienced a little bit of that too. But tough guy, stubborn as fuck, was proud of it, had a great career. What was one of the, uh, can you tell us one of the things you learned or maybe one of the greatest things you learned from, uh, Ole? Cause I know when you come into wrestling, I mean, you're still uh, a bit of a novice. You're learning, you're wet behind the ears, man. He, by the time you get there, he's 
done it and seen it all. Did you learn anything that you carried with you for the rest of your wrestling adventure? I can't really say that I did because Oli was so much like Vern. And that's probably one of the reasons I gravitated towards him um, immediately. I first got to know Oli. It was, it was just like talking to Vern. And there wasn't really anything to learn. There was a lot that Oli reinforced, I think, from, from my time in the AWA. And our t- kids, Oli would talk for hours about psychology and mostly about psychology. And it was like listening to Vern and like listening to Wahoo McDaniels or listening to Ray Stevens. I spent hours and hours and hours over the years listening to those guys after the office closed. You know, when, when there was a refrigerator in the AWA offices, it was always filled with Miller Lite. And, you know, at the end of the day, we'd all sit around and have a couple of beers and I'd just sit and listen to stories. I didn't have any to contribute. All I could do was listen. But to sit there with Vern and, and Wahoo and, and Ray Stevens, it's just, you know, Greg Gagneau. It was just so much fun listening to them talk about wrestling so that when I left that environment, I go to Turner where I was an outsider. Nobody knew me. Uh, I didn't really have anything in common with her. It's the new kid on the block, but Oli was kind of like an extension of that wrestling family I had in, in the AWA. It's pretty remarkable what, what all Oli did behind the scenes of professional wrestling. I mean, I think most people listening to this know that he was a top star and a top draw and a main event everywhere he went. And then we, we saw him, you know, towards the end of his career, teaming with Arn Anderson and becoming, uh, one of the founding members of the four horsemen and all that stuff. But behind the scenes, I mean, he just had a genius mind for booking before there were writers in professional wrestling, there were bookers and. He was in so such high demand. He would book more than one territory at a time, which couldn't have been easy, but clearly it was working. And, you know, I think he still had a logging business and I mean, he was an entrepreneur. He got professional wrestling and maybe he wasn't always the kindless, gentlest soul, but (laughs) he was our Archie bunker of professional wrestling. And that's a uh, great way to say it, brother. And, and I know that he's a polarizing figure and, and I don't pretend that I know Oli, but I don't know how you could take a look at his resume and his contributions and not feel like he left wrestling a better place than he found it. Um, thoughts and prayers to his extended family and man, the family of not just Oli Anderson, but Mike Jones and Paul Vashon. I mean, three days, almost back to back to back of just. Gosh, I hope that's the last time we have to talk about something like that for a while here, Eric. All right, listen up. We've got great news. We're excited to announce a new affiliate partnership with fanatics and the WWE shop. It's an easy way to support your favorite podcast shop, official WWE gear and apparel by using our special URL shop wrestling that's shop wrestling Or if you're watching along with us on YouTube, just hit that QR code that's up on the screen right now. And check out the description below for the link. We'll have it up on all of our socials as well. But you can shop with confidence for your favorite WWE superstar. Tees, hoodies, caps, championship belts, and more with the WWE shop. And don't forget to use our special link, shopwrestlingmerch.com. Not only do we get some great deals and some great swag, but it's also an easy way to support the show. That's shopwrestlingmerch.com. Me too. Me too. We, uh, we are going to be talking next week about your book. We did a poll over on YouTube about what you wanted us to talk about next. And you can vote in all of our polls. That's where they're going to be moving forward. 83 weeks.com next week. We're going to be breaking down Eric's book controversy creates cash. And we're going to read back what Dave Meltzer had to say about your book. Of course, we'll cover all the news and notes. I'm sure we're going to see the rumor and innuendo is that we're going to see a big debut on AEW television this week. And you're probably picking up what I'm putting down there because there's one big free agent who we don't know officially where they are, but we have a good idea. And maybe that will be revealed this week. And of course, next week, we'll be talking about The Rock and Roman and Cody and Seth. Is it just me or does it feel like maybe it's just because it's artificially inflated because it's WrestleMania season? 
but with Sting's last match and WrestleMania season right here, the huge elimination chamber event, the huge crowd in Greensboro, WrestleMania right around the corner. It feels like there's more momentum right now in wrestling than there has been in, in a few years, Eric. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and that $5 billion Netflix deal kind of kicked it all off, didn't it? Oh, there's just, that too. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I mean, so many things going on in such a short period of time. How, did, how can you not be excited to be a wrestling fan at this point? It's awesome. If you're looking for some Sting talk, some Revolution talk, and yes, we will talk about Sting repelling down from the rafters. That's all available for you now over at 83weeks.com. We covered it all as part of our AEW Revolution pay-per-view pre-show and then the reaction show. If you haven't already, be sure to check out 83weeks.com. You can check out those videos, but be sure to hit the subscribe button and maybe more importantly, hit the notification bell so you know the next time we're going live. And if you've got a question about next week's show, or we're going to be breaking down Eric's book and what Dave Meltzer said about that book, you can ask it right now at 83 weeks on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or maybe the easiest place to make sure we're going to see your comment. Hit us on YouTube, 83 weeks.com. Drop your comments and your questions below, and uh, we will find them and highlight them here next week. Eric, I don't know uh, what to expect with uh, the twists and turns as we get to WrestleMania, but I want to put you on the spot right now. Do you agree with my theory? Do you think uh, The Rock turns on Roman and Cody Rhodes leaves champion night two at WrestleMania? 100%. 100%. Uh, I hope we didn't jinx it. I mean, we'll see you guys. No, next. But, 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 I mean, I absolutely believe that's what's, that's going to be the final outcome, but I think how we get there yes. is the most intriguing thing in a long time. Uh, hypothetically, could we get you in a pink bathrobe next week? I don't have one, but I'll find one. We could get LaGreca's. We'll see you next week right here on 83 weeks with their Bischoff.